Isolations have been a staple in basketball for as long as I can remember. The ability to break your man down one-on-one -on -one is one of the most valuable traits a player can have. Over the years, we've seen some masterful isolationists, but in the game today, only a few players are efficient enough for these plays to take up a large chunk of their team's offense, and Shea Gilgis Alexander is one of them. Despite not playing in the best offensive situation, Shea was third in the NBA at about 7 isolation points per game and did so at a very efficient 1.06 points per possession. And while it's easy to just look at the numbers, the technique behind how he breaks down the defense is unlike anyone else, posing a unique challenge for whoever stands in his way. Shea's entire attack is built off of how well he changes pace. And it's not about sheer speed or just exploding downhill off of the initial burst, but rather the art of starting and stopping with perfect timing. He's constantly hesitating and almost pretending to be lazily resetting so that he can set up his man and blow right by them when they least expect it. As he pulls back out to the perimeter, he appears to be sizing up, but that's actually the move he darts out of on his way to a wide open floater. Everything he does is so fluid and smooth, meaning he can take that first step out of any dribble in one motion, and I know I said it's not about sheer speed, but he's pretty damn fast. He really likes to burst while going between his legs. Again, it's not the move and then the drive, but one motion as he builds up that head of steam and leaves his defender in the dust. Another thing you'll notice at the point of attack is that Shea's reacting to every little thing his defender tries to do and making the right adjustments in real time. He first throws a left hand hesitation and Siakam starts to bite, so he quickly counters by going between his legs and gets to the paint for a floater over the top. To get to that top speed a touch faster, he'll get extremely low to the ground. His torso is nearly parallel to the court, with his back foot dragging instead of lifting and stepping, almost like a running back as he sneaks through little crevices in the defense. And he knows that more times than not, he won't have much difficulty beating that first line of defense, so as he gets into his drives, what he's looking at and reading is where the help's gonna come from and how to counter. Again, you'll notice how low he gets off that first step, and he knows that Zeke Najee's coming up to meet him. So after beating his own man, he hesitates before changing directions and goes up through the reaching arm for two points and a foul. His length really helps him in these spots. Aiton slides down from the nail to offer immediate help, so he makes himself skinny with one foot right in front of the other and takes a couple exaggerated strides on his way to the cup. Another thing that helps him here is how quickly he processes and reacts to whatever the defense throws at him. His initial burst gets cut off so he goes to a spin move but helps right there to meet him, so he quickly gathers the ball high to protect it as he takes those two long strides and with a shot blocker right in front of him he improvises again with a little scooping rainbow finish. On the topic of Shea's finishing, he probably has the craftiest use of angles I've ever seen. Once he touches the paint, Toronto's defense collapses with two big defenders on his right and their best shot blocker on his left. He takes off laterally to make mid-air contact and outstretches his left arm to sneak the ball right up in between both defenders, and his touch takes care of the rest. It's his length that gives him access to these types of layups, and he weaponizes it by constantly looking to adjust his release. He takes off with the left foot looking for a right hand finish, but Jabari Smith does a great job of getting a hand up, so he switches over to his left while using that right arm as a shield, and it just looks too easy. While he's primarily looking to finish on the floor and get the ball around rim protection by stretching his arms, he's also a deceptively quick vertical leaper off of two feet. He makes easy work of Bullock, again jumping into the body of rim protection to force that contact and finding an angle in midair for a potential three-point play. It's not about how high he gets when taking off vertically, but rather how quickly he gets off the floor and to the peak of his jump. 
he drives down the middle and uses a shoulder bump to create a little separation, and although it looks like his man is still in position to offer resistance, he just gets to the rim so much faster. Though shoulder bumps are so effective because he's incredibly strong, which is probably his most under-discussed physical trait. If someone gets in his way, he'll just go through them without much difficulty. Here he drops the shoulder straight into his defender's chest on a drive to create about a foot of space, then throws an up fake to get him off the floor, and that's just easy offense at the rim. Those bumps can also be used to set up short mid-range jumpers, and these sort of bump middies have become a huge staple in his game. As he drives, he's able to catch Trey Murphy off balance and leaning towards the paint, which he takes advantage of by throwing his shoulder into the core and a little chicken wing of the off arm, creating a ton of separation for the mid-range J. Here it is again, leaning his body forward and throwing all of his momentum into Royce O'Neal before pulling back into two points from the elbow. And although it looks simple and easy, there aren't many players, if any, who can replicate this. Looking once again at that freeze frame of him throwing his momentum into O'Neal, what I'm focused on is that back foot. It's facing the complete opposite direction, with his ankle touching the court, and in just a split second, both feet are perfectly squared so that he can get into his set motion. That's a testament to his ankle flexibility and it enables him to constantly shift his momentum as he throws together vicious combinations. His knee is nearly touching the ground as he pulls back, and when his drive gets cut off, he slams the brakes. If a regular human tried to plant their feet like this, it's probably ending in a trip to the ER, but for Shea, the normal rules just don't apply. Here's another example. It starts with that initial change of pace, getting real low on a drive, and when Looney turns his body to recover to the paint, Shea's gonna counter with a step back, but again, the back knee is nearly touching the ground as he shifts his momentum, which allows him to snatch straight into a jumper, all in one effortless motion. No matter how many times I run some of these clips back, the coordination, body control, balance and flexibility just don't make any sense. He's nearly at his top speed when he comes to a stop. At this frame, he's pretty close to doing a full split, with that front foot planted and the second one dragging in. And on the very next frame, that back foot is doing something that I didn't actually know was humanly possible, and that helps him create so much space from the mid-range. These freakish athletic tools allow him to stop and start, change directions, pretty much do whatever he wants in a timely manner. You have the exaggerated snatchback dribble with his knee nearly dragging across the court, which he immediately turns into a left-hand drive across the lane, and when a helping defender reaches, he goes up through the contact for a chance at three. I talked about how his game is built off of changing pace, and it's not just speeding up, but also slowing down. He throws all of his momentum into an explosive crossover and ducks real low, only to slam the brakes with a behind the back. Davon Reed is sent to a different dimension for research purposes, and Shea's left with a routine elbow jumper. He's probably the best in the world at decelerating or stopping on a dime, which means that he can just fall back on the short mid-range anytime he's cut off on a drive. Steph does a great job of sliding his feet and using his body to close off the middle of the floor with three other defenders walling the paint. So Shea comes to a stop and spins back towards the free throw line for a jumper over the top. This backwards pivot spin is one of his go-to counters, extending that front leg as much as possible on the plant and turning into a little fallaway through some outstretched contests. Here it is again, driving hard, throwing all of his momentum into Jackson Hayes to create more separation and spinning back to the elbow, except this time it's an up fake and he's headed to the line for two. The way he blends everything together and throws counter after counter is nothing short of masterful. First it's the drive, then it's the bump into a spin, then the up fake, and it all just looks so easy. These up fakes are just another one of his go-to counters. Even though Kuzma doesn't leave his feet, just a slight window of opportunity is all he needs for one of those incredible offhand finishes. 
This time he sets up on an open side of the floor from a standstill, but Draymond's pre-rotated to offer an immediate second body. So when Shea beats Kaminga off the dribble, there's no driving lane, instead stepping back, faking the midi, and stepping through for a real clean look from close. His footwork and timing are just perfect. Here goes another one of those ridiculous pullbacks, except this time instead of pulling the jumper, he keeps that front foot planted, then uses a lengthy step through on his way to a finger roll. And I'm not sure how many players in NBA history can gather out of a step back at the elbow and end the possession with a layup, truly some mind bending stuff. Because of the way he constantly fakes and carves out angles for himself with the use of footwork, he's maybe just as much of a threat to score after picking up his dribble. He first steps back into a fake, goes to that step through as if looking to lay it in, only to then sweep back to that initial angle for a mid-range jumper off the glass. And if defenders even think about biting on his fakes, it's pretty much guaranteed to end in a trip to the line and that's because he's got all the tricks when it comes to drawing fouls. If his defender tries to play him with active hands or reaches at the handle, he'll make his scoring move up through the arm, catching that hand in the cookie jar. If he's looking to score on a defender near the basket that's right in front of him, he'll go up through the body to draw contact. Not only is he not afraid of contact, he forces it, invites it, actively seeks it out, and the way he constantly plays through it at various points in his attack helps him earn a heap of free throws. Last season, he averaged just under 11 free throw attempts every game, third in the NBA behind Giannis and Embiid. Of every player in NBA history to average at least 10 free throws, he leads in percentage at 90.5. Kevin Durant in 2010 is the only other guy to reach 90 on that sort of volume. So, just to recap some of the things I've talked about, Shea's game is built off that initial change of pace, routinely beating the first line of defense with ease. When help comes, his length, creativity, and overall craft enable him to finish over or around them at will. If his initial burst is closed off, he showcases some incredible athletic tools that pretty much give him unlimited access to quality looks. And if he's forced to pick up his dribble, he's arguably just as lethal. If a defender is somehow able to take all of that away, then they have to worry about not sending him to the line for a 90% free throw. And I haven't even gotten to all of his counters. Now, I'm not a huge football guy, but someone replied to one of my tweets calling Shea the Barry Sanders of basketball, with the way he constantly pauses and hesitates to read situations, redirects and jukes into new attack angles, not relying on sheer explosiveness to break through, but weaponizing timely counters. And when you watch Shea, you kind of get that same feeling. Help rotates early so he pulls back and instead drives left, only to counterspin back down the middle and jump right into Valanchunas down low for a contact finish. Here's another one where he looks to drive, but Help at the nail turns him away, so he spins back in the opposite direction on his way to the rim. And there are a few reasons these spin moves are so lethal. First is of course his length, he can just cover so much ground while in rotation, and another is his core strength, and how that allows him to turn his body with so much speed and power. Kaminga slides right in front of him, so he throws a shoulder bump straight into one of those ferocious spins, and everything I've touched on, whether it be his body control or his footwork, just all works together so perfectly in enabling him to make these sorts of moves. He can also counter out of the spin, cutting it halfway through and turning back to that initial angle for a short jumper. Or he can turn the half spin into yet another counter. Instead of taking the fall away jumper, he fakes and steps around Grant Williams for a push shot off the glass. On top of all of this, I haven't even mentioned his remarkable ball security capable of keeping his dribble alive and operating through even the tightest spaces despite having a 6'11 wingspan. He'll just probe and probe as he hunts out the most efficient opportunities possible. 
That's why he's able to dribble the ball as much as he does, while still keeping his turnover rates incredibly low. Everything is so in control and smooth, playing with a level of poise that almost reminds you of when a D1 player shows up to the high school pickup runs and plays at 45% speed so that they don't get injured. And because of how well he operates in tight spaces, he's capable of starting live dribble isolations from inside the arc, throwing a hesitation straight into one of those explosive spins and using his length to finish around Ant's body for two. Here it is again. Miami's in a zone so the paint is packed, but that means he has room to work with from the middle of the floor. Again, it's a hezzy into a spin, this time to set up a turnaround mid-range jumper. It's the same thing when facing up from a standstill, where he's mastered the one or two dribble pull-up game. It's not just ball security that keeps him so effective when given a lack of space, but also his ability to score over the top of defenses. All five Knicks defenders are touching the paint in some capacity, but Brunson just doesn't have the size to contest the jumper. This is why Shea's still been able to score so effectively over the past couple seasons, even without proper spacing. Zubats is waiting under the basket, so instead of following through on a drive, he creates separation from Reggie Jackson with a step back J. Here's another one where the paint is just completely packed, and Kevin Durant has a 7 foot 5 wingspan, so it's not like this is easy offense. With an exaggerated sidestep, he creates all the separation he needs for a drifting midi. That tough shot making is the key to unlocking these opportunities. Again, every Minnesota defender is focused on protecting the paint, and Shea's spin doesn't actually create any space, but he's still able to rise up and knock down what probably should have been a three-point play. Like I mentioned earlier, everything blends together and you get these possessions that make him look completely immune to defense. First, it's the change of pace on a drive right that doesn't lead to anything, so he resets for an isolation from inside the arc. Some tight ball handling doesn't create much, so he decides to instead turn his back to the basket and back his way into the paint for a turnaround jumper. Post-ups are yet another layer to his arsenal. Last season, he averaged 1.5 points a game, and if you want to count DeRozan as a guard, that would put Shea third in the NBA behind him and Luka and he does so on a very efficient 1.12 points per possession. Against smaller defenders, he'll use his size and strength to his advantage, physically forcing his way to the middle of the lane for one of those patented bump middies. There's a level of unpredictability in how he's going to attack while backing his way in close because he's capable of turning over either shoulder with those agile spins. He has amazing feel and timing for when to make his move, something that separates a lot of post players from others, just knowing how to read a defender without seeing him. When working near the right baseline, he's most commonly looking to get to a post fadeaway over his left, again showcasing some phenomenal shot making. But he also has these little tricks and tactics for gaining the advantage. Mikhail's expecting the baseline fade, so he makes almost a swimming motion with his right arm and sort of propels himself to the restricted area, with nobody in position to turn him away. And just like on his drives, he has a counter for everything the defense throws at him, using that same off-arm push towards the middle, but this time Anthony Davis is waiting so he counters with one of those sharp spins back towards the baseline for that left shoulder turnaround jumper. The importance of this post element is that it just gives him another spot to operate. The thing about isolations is that they can sometimes stagnate an offense, but with this much versatility in how he gets into them, where he gets into them, it can come within the flow and serve as a counter for whatever look opposing defenses decide to throw. Now, I started my breakdown by talking about Shea's live dribble isolation game on the perimeter, and another thing he really likes to do is quickly attack one-on-one -on -one in semi-transition or just with pace before the defense is able to properly set. Again, you see that body control and strength as he just throws Trendon Watford to the baseline, and in these spots, he's almost always looking to get to the rim. He averaged about 24 drives a game last season, first in the league by a landslide, and this is where a lot of them come, 
as it's where his length is best weaponized. Throwing crossovers or misdirections straight into exaggerated gather steps on his way to layups. And even with a little more downhill speed, if he gets cut off at any point, he's got all the counters, spinning around Kleba and going through contact from Christian Wood for two points plus the foul. As a product of the volume driving, he was able to mark just under 16 points in the paint a game, third in the NBA behind only Zion and Giannis, two of the most physically imposing forces to ever step foot on a court. Because he's such a threat to slash, what you'll see a lot of the time is defenders either sagging off or not meeting him with immediate resistance, and it's then where he'll start to utilize the three-point line. It's crazy to think that I've rambled for this long and gone into detail on various different aspects of isolation without ever mentioning the three ball, and that's because it's not really a huge part of Shea's overall scoring. He's an amazing space creator, often using pound dribble step backs or sidesteps, and a lot of times defenders are just forced to give him these looks due to a disadvantage in foot speed. He can get these jumpers off at volume whenever he wants, it's just a matter of whether or not he should be taking them, and actually knocking them down, as he's not a consistently efficient three-point shooter. He'll go on hot stretches that make him virtually unguardable, but when it averages out, you get a guy who last season shot just under two off-the-dribble threes a game and hit about 35.5% of them. Not bad, but not great. Among 71 players who attempted at least 100 of these, he was in the 56th percentile in efficiency. So even if it's not a huge part of his game, he's far from a non-threat. So where does that leave us overall? Someone who has the capability of scoring from all three levels and has mastered two of them, can operate with or without space from pretty much every single spot on the floor, and due to a combination of craftiness and functional athleticism, has an unlimited set of counters. I think he's one of the most talented isolation scorers I've ever seen, and I just can't wait to see how his game continues to evolve as the team around him gets better and better. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of Shay. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.